Okay, welcome. Let's start. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, David Zorno. So David is the president and founder of Lighthouse uh, Incorporated. And the mission of his company is basically using the 3D interactive uh, uh, devices and media that we know from, from video games to explain concepts that are that can't be explained by word and words and can't be explained uh, with uh, conventional uh, videos. And so one of the uh, exemplary projects that he did was together with the Stanford uh, Children's Health uh, to make an interactive uh, piece to explain to child patients uh, about uh, heart surgery and also of course to the parents. And I guess you've all been uh, in the situation where you talk to your doctor or your, your dentist and they wanted to do something to you and you wanted to know what are the risks, what's really going to happen. And these are difficult uh, conversations to have and uh, so uh, his piece is really helping uh, that kind of uh, situations. And so just looking at his uh, uh, credentials, so he has two uh, degrees, one in creative writing and the other one in computer science uh, from uh, Iowa State University and also from Yale. Then he spent like eight years as a journalist together with the LA Times, uh, basically covering uh, tech and business, so he really knows uh, internet culture very well. Um, then in 2012, he won one of the prestigious uh, Jonas Knight uh, Journalism Fellowships uh, here at Stanford. And so he spent a year here um, to work on 3D uh, and active storytelling and then uh, basically launched his own business uh, two and a half years ago. And so we are very fortunate to have him here um, to talk about uh, the title of his talk is The Power of Interactive World Building to Illuminate uh, Reality. So welcome, David. As you may hear, I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. I was literally eating spoonfuls of honey this morning, you should have seen me. It's a good excuse to, to just eat honey. Um, but, uh, so, uh, this is how it's gonna sound. Um, but, yes, thanks for the, the introduction, Ingmar. Um, that's, that's sort of the basis of, of my career and my work, is these intersecting strands of, uh, of journalism on the one hand, and of, you know, creative writing or, and storytelling on the other side. And um, when I, after I was a technology writer at the LA Times, I had the opportunity to come to Stanford to this great program they have here. It's a year-long fellowship for professional journalists, the John S. Knight Fellowships. And uh, the idea of that program is basically to, um, you know, encourage journalists to explore innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology to move journalism forward and to find new ways to tell stories. And so the one that I explored was using video game technology, graphics, and, and the, the technology that's been you know, created and fostered and invented for the last 30 plus years by, on, on the one hand, the animated film industry, and on the other hand, the, um, the game industry. And as you know, it's, it be, they've become very profitable and successful and um, generative industries. Um, so uh, I wanted to try to take that and turn it, uh, turn its focus to telling stories in reality. Um, so um, first of all, I'm going to talk. Of, there will be a few links and resources and things in this talk. And so if you're wanting to find them later or now, you can go to this link, lighthouse.us/talk, and you'll be able to see uh, what's in there. There's also a little survey link on that. It's a Google Docs page. Um, if you want to take the survey afterwards and give me some feedback on the talk, that would be great, too. Um, thank you very much for coming. I'd like to just do a quick kind of audience heat map to see uh, the various backgrounds of, of people. Um, would people raise their hands if they're sort of science and tech dominant, if you will? Okay, that's pretty good. How about humanities side? Cool, it's about, you know, 60-40, 50-50, that's pretty good. Um, of the, the science, well, of anybody, um, do you folks have experience designing or creating games, building games? That's pretty good. Cool. Great. Okay. Good to know. All right. Um, I would like to call forth for my first volunteer. Um, this volunteer will play a video game, and there's very low um, risk of embarrassment because it's a very easy game, and I'll only ask you to do it for a minute, and you'll have fun doing it. Anybody want to do it? Here's a hint on what the game is. Superman from 1978 for the Atari 2600. Anyone? Come on down. 
Thanks. What's your name? Jessica. Jessica, I'm David. Good to meet you. Thank you. So I'm just going to do this. So go, the arrow keys are what you will use. And um, the, the only hint I can give you, because I actually don't really know how to play it, is uh, that you just did it. So that's how you start. And then you can go, go back to the phone booth. On the, yeah, go back to the phone booth. Yeah, 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 you got it, you got it. Perfect. So this was the first video game that I ever owned as a kid. The Atari 2600. Um, one of the earliest personal video game systems, and it's Superman. I think, I think what you have to do is find a jail and drop him in the jail. There it is. There you go. Okay. Um, like I said, I'm not really sure about the user interface. There's those big blocks up there. Um, I don't think they're life. I'm, I'm not sure. I, there, I went on YouTube. Um, to, you know, they have these let's play videos of people playing, and I watch them, and basically everybody on YouTube is like, I have no idea how to play this. Um, and there's also this sort of the funny, um, funny design structure where you can keep flying vertically, and it's all, you're always flying up through the ground. And, you know, if you fly up again, you'll see that, oh, you lost your, I think you just have to walk to the next screen. Can you go up now? Yeah. Um, that's a... That's a, a damsel in distress, I think. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, see how when you fly up or down, it just goes through the ground. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And now you're inside, I guess, inside a building. That's a lobby of some sort. Yeah. Cool. I'll let you off the hook, because there's not much more to it than that. But thank you very much for your help. Well done. So the reason I wanted to start with that game um, is to just sort of show the, the beginning of the timeline of the video game evolution, where the characters were made of a few pixels, and the, the world itself was very abstract and not very descriptive. And, and then here's something from where we are today. Um, you, you, you've all seen sort of what, what video games look like now. I mean, the entire Superman game would fit, you know, in the, the corner of Batman's cape in terms of the number of pixels and just, you know, the level of detail and uh, the size and complexity and sophistication um, in my lifetime has gone from what you just saw to something that is now getting very close to photorealistic. And I think pretty soon, definitely in our lifetime, we'll stop being able to tell the difference on certain certain types of projects where is that video, is that real? Um, virtual reality will, will start to look real. Um, so the, the point of this dichotomy is goes right to the work that I've done. Um, so much of the energy and creativity um, of using these technologies has gone into games because of the ability to conjure and build kind of any kind of world you want, whether it's Batman or you know um, ancient battlefields or alien worlds, it's really in some ways a canvas where you can create anything you can imagine, much more so than you can do with with video or with photos. Um, text still sort of rules that because you can do you can do almost anything. You can do more with text than you can do with um, with graphics still. But graphics is allowing you to create things that you can't create with other media. Um, and so here's a little sort of Venn diagram um, that comes a little bit from my experience in journalism. And you have these different levels of media. Um, the three that I'm looking at here are text, photos, and, and video. Um, and each one has its own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and um, so what do you think when you think of text versus photos or video for something that it's good at in terms of describing or rendering? Um, 
anyone? Yeah? Imagination drives your, because videos or images give you what you see, and when you're reading text, you have to imagine. So it's not really limited by the reality in front of you. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes, sir? Print or text to me in a book, for example, is 300,000 words all the same size, where there's no prioritization of information. So it has sort of a neutrality to it that doesn't... An unfortunateness about it. Oh, that's a... They're all the same size. Oh, you'd prefer the text to be di like different size or? So what is important books important? Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's very monotone and visually. It's not a visual medium, really. Text is not meant to be entertaining to the eye in any way. Yeah. Any other things that text is good at? Yeah. It's good at representing internal states. Um, it's difficult to represent an internal state with an image. Sort of a, you know, a feeling or a thought. That's right. Yeah. Um, I would add to that, again, from a journalistic perspective, as somebody that did a, um, a lot of you know, reported writing, it's good for chronologies and describing what happened. Um, you know, whether it's Congress passed a bill, this many people voted for it, this many people voted against it, Senator so-and-so said this. So you get a sense of what happened in kind of an organized set of facts that wouldn't be so good. You couldn't really do that with a photo. Um, because a photo doesn't contain, you know, it doesn't really have a time scale to it. It's just a moment. Um, and you, you wouldn't want to do that with video, right? Because um, you wouldn't want to sit and watch the whole, it would be like watching C-SPAN. Um, so you, it allows you to, to condense things very nicely and succinctly. Um, how about photos? What are photos good at? Yeah. That's a really good way to put it, yeah. Um, it's a snapshot, literally, of, of a feeling, uh, a sense, um, the color allows you, um, um, it allows you an insight into the moment and what it was like. But it's, it's sort of a symbolic one, right? Because it's a moment frozen in time. So really, um, you are... Yeah, there's a symbology to a photograph that the photographer is choosing for you that may be represented over, or it may not be representative. It may have been something that they just froze in time that was a lucky moment, or it may really represent, you know, the, the refugees in Syria. Um, so it's good at just getting a very strong, concise sense of a moment. Um, here's a video. You, you may have seen this, just the, the explosions in the, the Chinese factory um, on YouTube. This was taken on an iPhone from a, a building um, a couple miles away. It's a, it's a really fascinating um, video. So with video, um, it's, it's sort of obvious. It's good at documenting what's happening in front of you in a very true sort of way. You press record and watch it, and what happened is what you get to see. But uh, sort of the weakness of that is all you have is that one perspective and that one moment. And so there's a static element to it where you, uh, you just have that one take on it, and there's no real dimension to it. So um, it's, it's, it's rigid in that way. So all of this is leading up to um, the medium that I play around with, which is graphics, computer graphics, and interactivity. And I'm just calling that virtual, for lack of a better term right now. I'm not necessarily referring to virtual reality, but it's, they're very similar. In virtual reality, you build worlds in these graphics, even if they're playing on a 2D screen like the ones I've done, it's still a virtual world that you're creating. Um, so when I, when I say G and J here, I'm referring sort of to the intersection of games, or game technology, and journalism. How can game technology, um, which, uh, you know, you can, you can, like I said before, you can create and build and conjure any world that you want to and make it do whatever you want to. How does that help you tell stories or render and explain reality? Um, 
And that's what I hope to be able to show you a little bit of today. Um, so I'm going to start with this sketch. And this is actually a sketch that Dr. Frank Hanley, who is a pediatric heart surgeon here at Stanford, did for me um, just a few minutes before he walked over to an operating table and operated on a three-month-old baby for 12 hours to, to fix the child's heart. The child had a congenital heart condition from when it was born. And so he performed a 12-hour surgery on the baby and saved its life. Um, but um, to be fair to Dr. Hanley, this was sort of a hastily sketched sketch. So I'm sure he could have done a, a better job in other circumstances. But to me, it's still a, a bit of a metaphor for the difficulty of explaining um, anatomical concepts and how the body works, especially complicated things like surgery. And this is actually um, a, a sketch of small arteries inside the heart, little tiny arteries. And this surgery is all about taking the little arteries and sort of Frankensteining them together in a, in a different way, sort of um, re-plumbing the heart, if you will. Um, and so he's explaining this to me, and I'm kind of nodding and smiling. Yeah, I, th I think I get it. And I'd already read a lot about this, this surgery because I was doing a job for Stanford where I was going to make a graphic about it. So I'd read a lot. I looked at videos. Um, but it's still tough to understand because it's stuff that you can't see inside the heart. And there's not a lot of video of that. It's hard to get video cameras in there. Um, there's not a lot of diagrams about it. So it's just a world that is sort of a little bit um, outside the, the bounds of traditional media, like I was saying, um, video and, and photos. And text is tough, too, because when you're explaining these things, it's so ridden with jargon and anatomical terms. And when you're trying to learn about um, any particular health um, condition or surgery, it's like, you know, the, the phenomenon of going on Wikipedia and the Wikipedia hole where you start on one article and then oh, I don't know what that means, so I'm going to click on that and then you get to another article and I don't know what all these things that explain the secondary thing means, so you have to just keep going layers and layers and layers and layers below until you have a, a giant network of different terms that you learn just to understand this top level thing. So it's really a lot of stuff to learn, even for basic um, surgery and, and anatomy. Um, this is, I want, it's a, it's a little bit, you know, gory, but this is actually a, uh, a photo that I took because I was standing um, at the side of the operating table during that surgery. And this is an open heart surgery on a baby. Um, open heart, just for folks who don't know, doesn't mean that you just open the chest. It means that you open the heart. They're actually opening up, making an incision in the heart so you can get inside the heart to repair or do what you need to do to it. Um, so in order for me to do my job, which was to create an easy to understand graphic and rendering of this heart surgery, um, actually going and seeing the surgery didn't help that much because this is what I was looking at. Um, the, the kid's heart was like the size of a plum. And there's all these wires and stuff going into it and, and people's hands in the way. And I'm trying to you know, crane my neck and look in, but I don't want to get it too much in the way, obviously. Um, so it's just you're not able to see and, or, or perceive that much from looking at the actual thing. Um, so that's sort of another reason why, uh, another place where graphics can come in and um, you know, fill the void of comprehension. And so now I'm going to actually show you the, the final product of that one. So this is on the Stanford Children's Hospital website. <clears throat> and it's also pretty soon it's going to be on the iPad, so anybody can go to the App Store and just download it. This is an interactive explanation of the topology of the low with pulmonary retrieval and the process we use to correct them. You can start with some background on how the heart works, get some basics of this congenital heart condition, or skip to the way Stanford surgeons repair the hearts of these pediatric patients. Or you can go through them all. It only takes a few minutes. So um, just to sort of state the obvious, 
this is not, it's not a YouTube video. It's an actual interactive experience. And so I'm going to click on the first chapter here. The heart is a pump at the center of the human circulatory system. It beats tirelessly, moving blood through a network of veins and arteries and delivering oxygen and nutrients to tissues and organs throughout the body. The circulatory system also returns... So you can actually sort of grab and rotate, move things around. So you can get a fresh supply of oxygen. The right side of the heart is on the left side of the screen, and vice versa. <clears throat> because the patient is facing you in this graphic. Blood that needs a fresh supply of oxygen arrives to the right side of the heart via the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, the body's largest veins. As the heart beats, <coughs> that blood gets pumped through the right atrium and ventricle and into the pulmonary artery, which leads to the lungs. So that's kind of a lot of terminology right there. Um, we wanted to simplify the vocabulary process a little bit by creating these glossary items where you could say, okay, so what's the right atrium? It's sort of like the heart's front door where blood coming back from the body first arrives. Every time the heart beats, blood flows into the right atrium from the vena cava. Then it moves into the right ventricle where it's pumped out to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. I'll do one more of these. Because this is an important one. This is the one that where it kind of goes wrong, the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is the big blood vessel that connects the heart to the lungs. Emerging from the right ventricle, it splits into two branches, one leading to each lung. These branches continue to branch into smaller and smaller vessels, which allow oxygen to more easily enter the blood in the lungs. So we will obviously want, <clears throat> so wanted to start with just a basic introduction to how the heart works because most people don't know that and you know it is, it's a little it's a little bit complicated it's got these two chambers that are separated and one pumps the blue blood that hasn't been oxygenated yet and one pumps the red, red blood that has been op oxygenated by the lungs and that gets pumped out to the body and then it comes back from the body and goes back to the blue side which pumps it to the lungs and there's all these different tubes and arteries and veins um, and if your child has a congenital heart, you know, condition, it's a lot of information flying at you. Um, and, you know, you may remember a little bit of it from biology, but probably not. And uh, so it's just not ideal conditions for absorbing and processing all this complicated information. So that's part of what we kind of wanted to do with starting with a primer. Here's what's what. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to this, this second chapter, which explains the actual heart condition. In tetralogy of Fallot, or pulmonary atresia, the paths that the blood normally travels to get oxygen have gotten a little scrambled during fetal development, and blood has to take a different pathway to reach the lungs. In this part of the graphic, you'll get to see what the condition looks like and why it impairs circulation. So again, this condition, <clears throat> is called Tetralogy of Fallot, and Fallot is the name of a French doctor, but Tetralogy just means there's four parts to the heart condition, and so this kind of goes through the different parts, and what they all add up to is that um, the child is not getting enough oxygen to its body, because um, as you can see here, there's a, a hole in the heart that allows the two sides, the two, the red blood and the blue blood to mix, and that means that the, the heart is actually pumping blue blood to the body that hasn't got ox gotten oxygenated. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about why that is. In tetralogy patients, the muscle wall that separates the two sides of the heart doesn't form properly, which leaves a hole between the ventricles. We call that a ventricular septal defect, or VSD. The VSD allows blue blood to escape from the right side of the heart to the left where some of it gets pumped out to the body without ever going to the lungs to be oxygenated. So we did this little... patient whose tissues are getting oxygen Oops. or blood may have bluish skin or fingernails. When you click on this, it goes back to the normal version so you can see the difference. That's the hole in the heart. The abnormal blood flow also means that parts of the heart don't develop as well as they should. One of those parts is the pulmonary valve, 
the door through which blood normally leaves the heart on its way to the lungs. But in pulmonary atresia, the pulmonary valve is completely blocked and the pulmonary artery never fully develops. That means blue, deoxygenated blood is forced to find a different path to the lungs. So this big artery is the artery to the lungs. And when it's closed off, there's no way that the blood can get to the lungs to get new oxygen. So the, that's why this is, is called a tetralogy because when it's kind of a cascade of different things that happens so that the, the heart uh, trying to keep the human alive finds this alternate route to pump the blood so that it, um, a little bit of it gets to the lungs so that it can get oxygenated, but not enough. Um, so it's, it's kind of fascinating. What happens, you can sort of see in this, in this um, view, is that the blood, this is coming from the body, right, over here, coming in from the, the vena cava and coming into the side that usually pumps it to the lungs, but it can't get to the lungs. So it's going across to the other side of the heart and then into the aorta, which, if you remember, is the big artery that pumps blood, blood all throughout our body, oxygenated blood. But the deoxygenated blood now is going up. It's like backing up, going reverse into the artery that should be pumping blood out to the body. But here's the last piece of it that explains why. With the, oops. In these patients, blue blood reaches the lungs through extra vessels that branch off of the aorta. Every human embryo develops these vessels called collateral arteries. As the fetus grows, the vessels are normally replaced by the pulmonary arteries. But here, the pulmonary arteries are blocked, so the body keeps the collaterals long past the embryonic stage. They're the only way that blue blood can flow from the heart to the lungs, which is why collaterals are critical to the surgical repair process you'll see in the final section. So I just wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll speed up now, but this is an important part because um, as embryos, we all have these extra little vessels that help our blood get oxygenated, and they fall away when we, when we get older and, and are about to be born. But on these babies, since their heart has no way to pump blood to the lungs, they keep these things. And so when the blood's going up into the, or the aorta, the back way, this is where it's going to, these little guys, which are still connected to the lungs. And that's the basis of the surgery, the repair surgery that they've innovated here at Stanford is to take those collateral arteries and sort of stitch them all together into um, what finally becomes a replacement pulmonary artery, that big blue one that was blocked. And that's what we see in this, the last part. In tetralogy this, below this is Dr. Hanley heart works less efficiently. Because the pulmonary artery is blocked, the heart has to push blood to the lungs the long way, out the aorta and through the collateral arteries. I'm going to skip this part just to so speed up a little bit. So you can see how unifocalization works by performing it yourself. In the operating room, the procedure can take more than 12 hours to complete. But you can do a simplified version here in a couple of minutes. <coughs> start by pulling one of the larger collaterals away from the aorta and attaching it to the blue-colored pulmonary artery above it. So this is what they were doing in that, that gross photo. This is the simplified version. And you don't even have to do any of the stitching. It's automatic. Sometimes the collaterals are a little small. So we make them bigger by sewing in some extra patch tissue. Grab one of the tissue patches and add it to the smaller collateral. Now, attach the enlarged collateral to the pulmonary artery above. See how it's ha they're sort of piece by piece, they're creating a larger, almost, you know, nice highway of now circulatory highway. Two collaterals on the other side. Good. You've repaired the pulmonary arteries. 
Now they will grow and strengthen over time, which will allow more blood to flow from the heart to the lungs. <coughs> Once we've done the unifocalization, we do a test in the operating room to see if blood is flowing well and at low pressure through the newly reconstructed so then pulmonary artery. They basically close that hole in the heart with a patch like this. Hole in the heart so deoxygenated blood can no longer escape to the wrong side. The last step of the surgery is attaching the homograft conduit. So this is basically a, a bridge. Directly to the reconstructed pulmonary yeah. artery. So the right ventricle can pump blue blood straight. They take that reconstructed pulmonary artery and then attach it with that conduit to the place it should be going in the heart. Now that the surgery is complete, the repaired heart functions largely like a normal heart. The right side pumps blue blood to the lungs and the left pumps red oxygenated blood to the body. Successful unifocalization patients have a very good chance of healing up and having near normal heart function and physiology. Any questions about that part? Yes. I'm trying to imagine you showing that with the Atari 2600 engine. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I might not play on the 2600. <laughs> oh, you mean uh, like with 8-bit uh, graphics? Or yeah, yeah, that'd be a little trickier. So, little Superman, Batman sketch graphic. Um, you can sort of see. Um, yes, go ahead. Has it been used for students for uh, to understand? Med students? Yeah. Um, I, I, not to my knowledge yet. Um, but I think that the, the first, the second chapter where it explains the nature of the disease. I think would be an okay primer to get the basics for students. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to teach anybody how to do surgery with the third chapter, but it, it's, it helps you know lay people understand the basics of it. Um, but I think it would be an okay introduction um, so that you know that you could build off for students for med students. Is that video or that available to the public? Yes. So it's the, the URL for that, which is listed in the. Um, the list of documents is 3dheart.stanfordchildrens.org. And just to refresh your memory, all, uh, everything is at lighthouse.us slash talk. So um, besides allowing you know, a certain amount of dimensionality and um, uh, visual depth that, that the graphics have. Um, I think there's another, the other side of games is the interactive part where, you know, if it was a video or if it was, you know, something on YouTube, a lot of times you press play and you, you lean back and may, maybe your attention stays consistent and maybe it doesn't. Maybe you get an email and you sort of move away. I think we've all done it. I, most videos we probably don't watch the end of or we lose attention in the middle, huh? But with games, there's this absorption that happens when you're playing because it's happening in real time. You're in control. And you have to do the next step. You have to fly the Superman around or fly the Batman around in order to move forward. So this is a property that um, is very useful for explanations too because it just makes it more interesting. You, you become the agent of your own learning and your own educational experience in order to move forward. You have to move forward in order to understand how the heart gets fixed. You have to fix it. Um, and so I, the, I see those as sort of the twin powers of what gaming has given um, the, uh, us explainer types is the, the visual depth and the visual sophistication and the power to engage and make it interesting and get people to focus and have a consistent level of focus on stuff. Um, so this is just one quote we got from the mother of a child that had to have this surgery. She said, I loved seeing this. It was the first time the specific ins and outs of Noah's operation have become really clear to me. And it's so much better than all the other explanations. Um, and uh, I mean, I. It, we did, there weren't a lot of other explanations to go up against, so I can say that and still be modest, but uh, it's 
it, I think it does allow people a way uh, to understand these complicated things in their own language and at their own pace. Um, and so we've gotten a lot of feedback like that from parents. Um, I finally understand what happened to my child. And sometimes uh, the child had the surgery 10 years earlier. And sometimes um, a, a person had the surgery 10 years earlier and they didn't even understand what happened to them because they just hadn't ever gotten a clear explanation. So it's really interesting to see people finally sort of understanding these black boxes of these complicated medical procedures that maybe they had a long time ago and forgot about or nobody ever explained to them really, really well. Did you do testing comparing parent ease of mind or parent understanding using a tool like this versus textbook explanation versus video versus in-person doctor? We're sort of at the beginning stages of doing that. So we have um, on the other uh, one, the other graphic that we just published, there's a survey at the end of it that asks, um, you know, how much did this augment your understanding of the procedure beyond the conversation that you already had with your doctor? Um, do you feel more or less like this is the correct um, type of procedure, this is the right procedure for your child? Did it raise or lower your anxiety about the procedure, which is an interesting question because when you're talking about stuff where a baby's life is at stake, there's already a lot of anxiety. And so it's, I, that one can kind of go either way. If you understand it better, you may sort of understand, well, you just got a big dose of brain surgery or heart surgery and that might make you nervous. On the other hand, um, maybe after the dose wears off, you start to feel like now the, this thing has been demystified and I have a sense, I can at least play in my head what's gonna happen and that will help me understand the longer term health implications and how to help my child with that. Is there a question? Okay, oh yeah. How, how much resource will it take to finish such a product? So remember when I was saying before the strengths and the weaknesses of the different media? This one has its, its strengths for explanation and interaction and absorption, but its weakness is that it's a lot of work. Um, and so, especially when you're talking about complicated procedures like this, um, it took uh, me three or four months just to do the research. And, um, you know, there, there aren't a lot of books written about this, uh, this these particular ones because they're somewhat rare uh, procedures. Um, so I had to, um, talking about sort of the, the pyramid of how media is created, I built this largely out of interviews and, and text. I, I interviewed the doctor, many doctors, multiple times, um, you know, read a lot of articles about stuff, found what, what existing images are out there, what existing video are out there, although as I said, the video was not that helpful, and then kind of took that and converted it into a, a visual storyboard a rough set of illustrations about what this can look like and then went back and forth with the doctors. Is this correct? Does this make sense? Is this simple enough? Is it, uh, oh, is it too simple? So it's a, it's a pretty involved process, especially the more complicated the surgery and the procedure get. Now, of course, there's a whole range of medical conditions and treatments, and if it was a simpler one, it would take less time. But the research and then the, the building of it take time and, and money. So um, that's the disadvantages of, of this newer medium is that it's still pretty labor intensive and it's not uh, as cheap as text, which is very cheap. Yeah, yeah building on top of that, did you talk about how big the game development team was for this and how much time did it take? Uh, <clears throat> for this one, it was just uh, myself, who uh, is not, I have a, some something of a technical background, but I'm not a game programmer. Um, and a 3D artist who builds the models um, and does the animation um, of the heart beating. So that in, in and of itself is pretty sophisticated because you have to do different models of the heart and kind of morph them together and you have to time it right. And so that was kind of the, one of the most difficult parts of it. Um, and then the third person was the, the game programmer who takes these 3D models and make, you know, the way I described it sort of waves his magic wand and makes him come alive and react to the rotation and, um, you know, I can click on it and move it. So that's sort of making the, the 3D models interactive. So the team was um, two technical people and myself. I was of course sort of like the director, producer, and then we had a designer person that was helping us script out what it was going to be. 
Was it like half a year project, a year? This one took um, eight or nine months because it was the first one we did, and we had to figure out what's, what are the research processes and kind of how to structure the whole thing so that it makes sense. But now that we've done it, we can do it faster because we kind of have it down a little bit quicker, but it's not going to be less. For something big, it's still going to be four, five, six months minimum. Yeah. Yeah. From a user perspective, um, and all, but also being a parent, the part that really hit me was when you were actually picking the pieces up and connecting them. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about going past not just the understanding of it, but also the, the, the parent um, empowerment. Because when I watched that, I, I was imagining my daughter was something like that and how disempowered I would feel about this black box. And actually moving these things around not only gives you understanding, but it also gives you a feeling that maybe I can help. Yeah, I think that um, there, there's a bit of a line between oversimplifying it, you know, because sometimes people chuckle when they see that, you know, do this 12-hour heart surgery in 30 seconds. Um, so you don't want to give the illusion that it's simple and easy and safe and low stakes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, mm -hmm. s simplifying it into something that is a reasonable approximation of the mechanics of it, I think does do what you said. It gives them a peace of mind. Um, it allows them to picture it. I mean, that, that not that sort of one of the elements of fear is being un unable to un understand and imagine what is happening? Because you, you have no control when you can't even, when you have no idea what's going on. So that's the idea, is to give people a sense of what is happening and to show them that there is an actual physical, mechanical basis for this repair. And even though you, know, you have to be a highly trained surgeon to do it, um, what they're doing is um, a prescribed set of steps that is sort of explained by this. It's just, you know, if you're doing it, you're, if you're actually doing it, it's a, a little bit trickier. Yeah? A comment on a question as both a parent and a grandparent. I'm blown away by what I just saw. Oh, that's great. In terms of its relevance to a parent who has that child. But in terms of general understanding, especially, and building new understanding on older knowledge using such technologies. I can keep on with the word please, whatever the cost. Uh, I just think it's got all kinds of enormous future applications. Well, thank you. That's great. And if cost is not an option, uh, is not a problem for you, we should definitely talk. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could <laughs> Was there another? Yes. You've talked a lot about cost and that it's time consuming. Do you see um, that this might be also a case for uh, traditional media to do that? Like, yes. So I'll, I'll use that as a segue um, because we, we don't have so much time. I was going to show you um, the other project that we just published, which is on a different um, condition called hydrocephalus. Um, but I'm going to skip that. However, if you want to see that, again, the link is in that, that set of links. Um, and this one is uh, it's, uh, um, in some ways, um, it's, it's different than the heart surgery because hydrocephalus is, whereas that heart surgery is pretty rare, hydrocephalus is extremely common. It's one of the most common birth defects, con congenital defects, um, especially in developing countries. And this is the basis for the photos you see of kids with bigger heads, um, in, often in India and in Africa. And essentially what it is is... Um, these ventricles in the brain, we all have these set of chambers in our brains. You, you probably, well, I didn't know this when I started, but there are these chambers um, that are full of fluid in the brain. And it's cerebrospinal fluid that pumps through your brain, around your brain, into your spine, and then back up. And it sort of bathes and protects your brain and your spine. Um, but it's manufactured inside these, these uh, chambers. And I'm, sh I'm showing you this graphic. Um, the one I did explains it a lot better, but this will be quicker. Um, and so what happens uh, in these kids is that the, the chambers get blocked. And again, like plumbing, they start to expand. Um, and there's fluid builds up inside the head. And so here at Stanford Children's Hospital, um, Dr. Jerry Grant 
uh, has a, does a pioneering surgery where he goes in and basically kind of fixes the plumbing up and decreases the pressure inside the head so that the head can uh, sort of return to a more normal size. Um, but uh, the point I wanted to make was that this one is, there are hundreds of thousands of cases of this a year, and so we were hoping this time that this one has a broader reach so that people all around the world um, can get sort of a more in-depth understanding of how this condition works. I'm going to skip the demo for now, though, but you're welcome to look at it online. Um, to media, so um, uh, graphics in media have evolved a good amount in the last few years, but most of what you sp see, especially in the print editions, for those of you who still read it, are uh, stuff like this. And um, this is in no way a knock on these kinds of graphics. It's more of a, um, the point is more that there's a sort of a, a limitation to the style of them. And they they're kind of rely on this, you know, bubbles and charts and graphs. And um, they can explain, you know, quantitative trends and demographic trends reasonably well. Um, but they're, they're within a very narrow envelope of the, the types of things they can explain. So what if we took these interactive 3D graphics and applied them to storytelling and media, which is what I started, this whole thing started when I was uh, um, at the, the Knight Fellowship. So one more demo. So this is a, um, this is a mock-up, and uh, one of the partners I've been working with is the Dallas Morning News, and the idea is that um, you would have a interactive embedded in a news story, and in this case, it's an explanation of fracking, how fracking works. So fracking is it's um, you know a big story. There's a lot of controversy around it. It's in the news a lot, um, but people, most people, I don't think have a visual sense of exactly what it is or how it works. And so that's what I wanted to do was take these graphics and show people kind of what fracking actually is. So you would just scroll down and click on it. And I'm guessing it's going to take a minute to load because it's going off my phone. So it's saying um, most of the new oil and gas wells around the US are, are from fr are fracked wells rather than traditional oil drilling wells. And it's helped, it has helped us leapfrog Saudi Arabia as one of the main um, uh, fossil fuel producers. So this is kind of giving you, and once again, I'm, as I click and rotate, I can kind of control this, I can zoom in. Oops. The zoom isn't working, but you can zoom in. Um, the way that they find uh, the rock to frack is by kind of doing an x-ray of the earth and they find okay there's the shale rock that we need to get down to um, and so this one asks you to plot the path of the drill until you get down to the correct depth and oftentimes it's more than a mile underground they're drilling down to if you can imagine that and the, one of the characteristics of fracking is that you drill down but then you're drilling to a, a narrow stratum of this shale you know, which is basically fossilized organisms from 100 million years ago, car carbon-based organisms. Um, so that you have to go sideways into the shale. And that's what um, part of the frac drilling is that you're drilling horizontally. So this asks you to drill sideways too. And then this drill will follow the path of the, um, the path that you just plotted. And it pauses here at the water table because that's kind of one of the locuses of problems with fracking is that you're drilling through water that is used for agriculture and for drinking. And if there's any problems with the pipes that you put in there, there's a lot of chemicals that are used in fracking and they can potentially get into the water. So this is just, this demo only has about, <clears throat> excuse me, about the first half of the fracking process. The second half is once you've drilled that well, you have to pump in a ton of water and chemicals that kind of keep the friction on the water low and um, kind of 
has, uh, provide solvents and stuff like that, but a lot of these chemicals that, that are in fracking are very caustic and toxic. Um, so the, the second half of the demo is going to show the pumping of the water and um, the idea of fracking, or hydraulic fracturing, is that you're pumping the water into chemicals at such high pressure that it literally shatters that shale rock, which releases all the gas and the, the oil pump that kind of pumps back up the pipe and then you collect it and that's what fracking is. Um, and with all the um, environmental concerns that you could imagine going along with that, if anything wrong happens along the way, if the pipes crack, if the chemicals get spilled, what do you do with all that fracked water once you're done with it? Well, they pump as much as they can out and then put it in a, a pool, um, but half of it or more doesn't get pumped out, just sits in the earth. And so there's all kinds of questions about pumping tons of water down into the earth. Can that change the seismic activity? There's lots of earthquakes in Oklahoma now when there didn't used to be. And there's also lots of fracking wells. So um, back to the idea of a topic that you can't really explore with a camera because it's a mile and a half underground and how are you going to get it down there? It's hard to picture this stuff with traditional means, so this is why this could be a good application for it. And to kind of answer your question about the media, um, this is, as you can see, it's a lot more lightweight than the, than the heart surgery. So this one could be done in a couple months or a few weeks um, for a lot, you know, a, more, a smaller budget. Um, so, but again, the news world moves fast and they don't have big budgets. So if you're working in, in media, you have to pick a story that you're going to be able to reuse and it's going to have a long shelf life. It can't be something that's going to be here today, gone tomorrow. You have to kind of think ahead and plan for it. But yeah, it, the idea is that could work for explaining things in, in the real world too, in media. Um, I think we're probably coming to the end of, the end of our time here. But if we have any other questions, let me know. Yeah. Fracking, so that it's actually not published yet. Yeah, so um, I'm going to build the second half, and then we'll publish it with the Dallas Morning News and some other partners. So you guys got a little bit of a, a sneak peek. Yeah. So, well, I think we're we're done. But thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate your time. Yeah.